Good afternoon. Welcome back. We are now at Matthew chapter 14. And we are now at this section, the third section on the screen, the king retreated. Well, he retreated because of opposition to him and to his ministry, which we have covered even from chapters 11 to 13. And now we are at chapter 14 to 20. This is the section, the king retreated. So Father, we just want to thank you once again for this privilege of sitting before your throne of grace. We ask, dear Lord, that you open our minds and our hearts to receive even the ministry of your words unto us. Lord, speak to us, reveal to us, and teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in chapter 14, there are four distinct sections. First of all, we see the death of John the Baptist. Looking at the screen, the death of John the Baptist from verse 1 to verse 12. Second section is uh, feeding the 5,000, a miracle that was recorded in all the four books of the Gospel. This is from 13 to 21. And then the third section is Jesus walked on water. Verses 22 to 33. Finally, from verses 34 to 36, we have uh, his ministry in Genesaret. So, let's start with verse 1. And as I mentioned earlier, this we see our Lord Jesus retreating in this section. And we will look more at that when we look at verse 13. So verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. And therefore, these powers are at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, and although Herod the Tetrarch wanted to put John the Baptist to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. So let me put the scripture on the screen for you. Yes, this is what we have just read. Now, now who was Herod the Tetrarch? Now we all know Herod the Great. He was uh, remembered for his very ambitious projects. He constructed the, uh, the temple and, and uh, many other big structures, even Masada. In any major construction or great taking, he would be doing it. Anyway, he was an evil man and when he died, he had three sons. So there were three Herod juniors. Now he divided his, Herod the Great, he divided his empire into four sections. And one son took one portion, another son took two portions, and the third son took one portion. So one plus two plus one, you have four. And so Herod the Tetrod, this Herod took the fourth portion, just one portion, but he had oversight uh, over he had oversight over Israel, over Jerusalem. I think it is Jerusalem, but definitely over the Israeli people. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, "This Herod was very evil to the extent he even killed his own." family 
for his own selfish reasons. Uh, of course, he wasn't exactly that kind, even to his people, to the Jews. And previously, earlier on, he had John the Baptist arrested in prison. And we saw this, we saw this even in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, if you remember. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. So Jesus left Nazareth uh, and he came to dwell at Capernaum where he made it his HQ. Now, why, why, did, why did Herod arrest John the Baptist? Because John the Baptist told him, rebuked him for taking his brother's wife. He has a brother, a half-brother by the name of Philip, and her name was Herodias. And he took his brother's wife for himself. He first divorced his wife, and then he took his half-brother's wife. And John the Baptist, seeing that this Herod had oversight over the Jews, uh, held him to a high standard that what he did was immoral and so told him that it was not lawful for him to take his brother's wife. And so John the Baptist was arrested. And by the time we come to, John, to, to Matthew chapter 14, at this point, this Herod had already executed John the Baptist. And having John the Baptist out of the way, he, he could then go about having his own way. But then again, he saw and he came to know of this person, Jesus. And Jesus, who had taught many and did much miracles. And so, he was wondering, who is this person? And According to tradition and superstition, all these are so paganistic, he assumed that whatever powers that were in John the Baptist after he had died, he probably had risen, and these powers are transferred to the person of Jesus Christ. And that's why we read in verse 2, this is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, that means Jesus in the person of John or John the Baptist in the person of Jesus, risen from the dead. Therefore, these powers are at work in him. This is purely superstition from that age. And so verse 3 explained, For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he wanted to put John the Baptist to death earlier, but he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. So the people counted John the Baptist as a prophet. So we read on, but before that, um, I want to show you that he wasn't just afraid of the multitude. He was also afraid of John. He recognized that this was a godly man. So in Mark chapter 6, verse 20, Therefore Herodias, reporting the same incident by Mark, Therefore Herodias held it against him, against John the Baptist, and wanted to kill him, but she could not. This wife, this Herodias wanted to kill John the Baptist, but she could not, for Herod, Herod the Tetrarch, feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So he enjoyed the, the company and the teaching and the sharing by John the Baptist. And he did not want to kill this holy man and he protected him. You see, here is a man 
who wanted something but feared the multitude. Even though he wanted, he wanted, as we read in chapter 14, verse 5, although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude. He feared John because John was a just and holy man. And he himself was also enjoying the, the, the teaching of John the Baptist. So what we have here is one who is double-minded. And what did James say about a double-minded person? James chapter 1 verse 8. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So we see now he wanted to kill John at the instigation of his wife, but he feared the multitude, so he did not. Later we shall see, he did not want to kill him, but because of the multitude around him, so he, he uh, fulfilled the desires of others around him. Let's put that on hold. So now we go on to verse 6. Verse 6 of Matthew 14. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Now, in those days, such dancers were quite seductive and quite suggestive. And I am sure she wore very skimpy clothes and it probably aroused Herod. And in moments like this, he was weak. And sometimes in weak moments, a person makes lousy decisions, poor decisions. And so as it was here. So, this was a very bad environment, bad situation. And here comes the daughter of Herodias. Uh, it, her name is not recorded, but according to the historian Josephus, her name was Salome, S-A-L-O-M-E. And she was probably a teenager between the age of uh, ages of 12 to 14. So, the daughter of Herodias danced before them, before the people, and pleased Herod. Surely this is lustful. Therefore he promised an, with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Verse 8. So this daughter was very well uh, instructed and prompted by the mother, the evil mother. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. It is like delivering the kick's head, uh, pig, pig's head, which you slaughter and serve to you on a, on a platter. Verse 9, And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So, when we read verse 9, you notice that this Herod at this point did not want to kill John the Baptist. But because of his dinner guests and because of the oath he had given earlier in verse 7, he promised with an oath to give this Salome whatever she might ask. And so because of the oath and because of those dinner guests around, he did not want to lose face. So, he commanded it to be given to her. That means John the Baptist to be executed and his head delivered on a platter. So, we see in verse 5, he wanted to kill John the Baptist, but he feared the multitude, so he didn't. Now, in verse 9, he doesn't want, he didn't want to kill John the Baptist, but he did anyway because of those who sat with him. So, a couple of verses I think we can look at. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. We read in verse 9 here, And the king was sorry. 
he was remorseful. King Herod was remorseful, but he was not repentant. Because if he were, then Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. And I am sure we have seen with our own eyes that for some people, they feel sorry, but only sorry because they were caught. Sorry because someone uncovered their devious schemes, but they were not repentant. Repentant is to do a U-turn and not to repeat whatever uh, unrighteous act you have done. So we have this Herod, who was sorry, remorseful, but not repentant. And another one, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, uh, for that they are futile. These are people who are wise in their own mind. So here you see, this, in short, this Herod was a fool, was indeed a fool. He was just putting on a show what he had was fear of men instead of fearing God. John the Baptist feared God, but not this Herod. He feared men. And so he commanded it to be given to her. We can look at Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9, I'm sure we all know quite well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So you want wisdom? There must be fear of the Lord. Fear God first. And if you want understanding, you must have the knowledge of the Holy One. And so we fear God and to have the knowledge of the Holy One, the Word is here. Study the word, meditate upon the word, and you will have understanding. So, back to Matthew chapter 14. Now we look at verse 10. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. Then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. I am very certain, I am very certain that the disciples were distressed, they were discouraged and depressed that their mentor, the one who discipled them, the one who baptized them, John the Baptist, had been executed. And can you imagine if someone serves another person's head on a platter to you? How would you receive it? We don't want to think about it. So, it is not easy. They came and took away the body, buried, and then went to tell Jesus. They were so discouraged. But when they were discouraged, they went to Jesus. They did not go back into the cave, go back into their home, bear, dig a hole and bury themselves in and hide. They went to Jesus. So what is the lesson here? When discouraged, go to Jesus. When you are down, when you are depressed, when you are distressed, go to Jesus. So with this, we have... Uh, finish the first section, the first segment of this section, Death of John the Baptist. Next, 
we look at Jesus feeding the 5,000. It is a record. It is a miracle. I'm sure all of us know it so well. And what we are seeing here is we are going, we are looking at this from the Herod's feast to the Lord's feast. Can I say that again? From Herod's feast where there was this seductive dance be among in the presence of all these dinner guests. I'm sure they had food, they were feasting. It was a party. And now we look to the feast of Jesus where the people were fed, 5,000 of them. And here was a miracle recorded for us in all the four books of the gospel. Four of them. And there must be a good reason why this is the only miracle that was recorded in all these four books. Because here we can see the power and the compassion of Jesus Christ. We can see him multiplying the food. And the food can be can symbolize the word of God. And even as Jesus fed the people, the multitudes who came to him with nothing, he did so with the help, with the participation of the disciples. And so as Jesus desired that his word be uh, uh, propagated to be preached to all the world, it will be done through his disciples. And then when they have eaten and and, and uh, the, there were remaining uh, crumbs or bread and they fill up, there were 12 baskets. And these 12 baskets, they actually point to a day in the future when there, the remnants of Israel, there be the 12 tribes of Israel. So God's plan and work and will for the Israelites, for Israel, is not over yet. It is not over. It will endure until the end. So, that is just a brief introduction of this uh, miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000. So, we look at verse 13. When Jesus heard it, heard what? Heard the beheading of John the Baptist. He departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. So you might ask, oh, was Jesus afraid? Why was he running away? Uh, probably uh, just to save he, he himself uh, uh, so that he may not be arrested and be executed. No. He went away to pray. He went away to pray. If you look at Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5 verse 16, and he does this often. In Luke chapter 5, verse 16, so he himself, Jesus, often withdrew into the wilderness. As we have just read, he went to a deserted place by himself. He went into the wilderness and prayed. He did this often. I am sure he was saddened and probably mourning for his cousin, John the Baptist, who was beheaded. But he wasn't about ready to be arrested and to be uh, uh, judged by the, the Pharisees, Sadducees, or the Romans, whoever. Because his plan, that in his plan there is a schedule as determined by God the Father. And it wasn't his time yet. And he didn't want to present himself at that point or to force the hand of Herod to arrest him before his time. So he still had work to do. So, when, he, when Jesus heard it, verse 13, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But 
When the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. So, where exactly? Can we have an idea where did Jesus go? He, dis- he went by boat to a deserted place. So, for that, we look at the same in, uh, record, similar record, but this time it's in Luke chapter 9, verse 10. Luke chapter 9, verse 10. It is still the same event, feeding the 5,000. And in verse 10, And the apostles, when they had written, when they had written, where did they go? If you remember, in a few chapters earlier, I, uh, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sent them out two by two to go and preach the word, preach the gospel. And so they were away. And when they had returned from their ministry, they told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place or wilderness belonging to the city of Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom and healed those who had the need of healing. So, to help you, let's look at the map. Let's look at the map. So this is a very familiar map. I, I, I selected this map for you because all the different, uh, all, all the miracles at the different places are, are, are highlighted for you. So this is the Sea of Galilee. We all know it so well by now. And so this is Bethsaida. Okay, Capernaum was where his headquarters was. And so from here, he was told, because he wasn't at Nazareth, he left, he went to Capernaum. When he heard that John the Baptist was executed, he went by himself and then his disciples came. He went to this place, Bethsaida, which we just read in Luke chapter 9. So, those days they went by boat. These days we go by MRT. So, but when the multitudes heard it, back to Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, they followed him on foot. So, not everyone went on board. Probably it cost a bit of money. Anyway, there probably were, were not enough boats. So, the multitudes. They went on foot, and you can almost assume they went on the coast side, coastal side, and they walked to Bethsaida. So they must be quite far from their homes, uh, from the cities, quite a distance away. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude. So this was the wilderness. This was a deserted place. And when Jesus looked out, he wanted to be by himself and and later with his apostles, with his disciples. Then he saw a multitude. He probably saw it is like Israel in the wilderness. When they left Egypt and they went into the wilderness for 40 years, it was something like them of old. He saw a great multitude in the wilderness. They had surely come a long way on foot, by foot. And he was moved with compassion. And he was moved with compassion for them. And we all know by now, in all the ministries of our Lord Jesus Christ, it always started with the compassion in him. It is that feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another person. And more than that, wanting to do something with the desire to, to, to alleviate the suffering of the person. And that is compassion. It's not just to see and walk away, but to see and want to help. And he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. And so it is written uh, for us, he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. But if you look at Mark chapter 6, verse 34, 
if you look at Mark chapter 6, verse 34, there was something he did before he prayed for the sick. This is the same record for us, the same event. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. When the day was now far spent, his disciples said to him, came to him and said, this is a desert, deserted place and, and already the hour is late and so on. So, if we put them together, if we put them together, Jesus came out, saw the multitude and he saw like this were like sheep without a shepherd and he began to teach them first. And then he prayed for the sick. This is very similar to all his previous ministry up to this point. He would teach them and then he would pray for the sick. And so if you read all these gospels, in all these books in context, putting them together, then you go back to Matthew chapter 14, verse 14. He saw a great multitude. And he was moved with compassion for them. And he taught them, as we just read in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, and heal and heal their sick. And we by now should can safely assume this multitude they number a few thousand. I am sure there were many people who were sick, but he healed them all. And it all started with a stirring in his heart that is compassion and with the anointing upon him. He met their need and they were restored. Verse 15, when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. Well, anything wrong with this? Anything wrong with this? Nothing. It is a very, it is a very logical suggestion. It is a very logical suggestion. They walk by day, I mean, by on, on foot the whole day, they come to this deserted place. Is it already getting late? There are, there, there are no uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, no McDonald's, no fast food, no hawker center. So perhaps you should send them home. They can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But they are in the presence of the King of Kings. They are in the presence of their Lord. And they have, they have heard his teaching and they have just seen another miracle or miracles because thousands were healed. So surely they were in the presence of a deity of Jesus. He is not another man. If he can even heal all the sick, all the sick, the thousands of them, what is it he cannot do? So it is some it is for, for, for us, you know, sometimes there is a disconnect. What we see and what our brain process and what that comes forth from our mouth, they seem to have a great disconnect because something is missing somewhere. They heard, they saw, and now they said, Jesus, send them home, send them away so that they can get food they forgot that they were in the presence of a miracle worker. But a lesson to learn. These disciples must not send the people away for food. Because if they want food, they must come to Jesus. Similarly, the church, the church must not send people away for spiritual food. The church must be the place where they are fed with spiritual food. If you remember 
John chapter 21 verse 15 when Jesus asked Peter three questions do you love do you love me let's turn to John 21 verse 15 and if you look at John 21 verse 15 Jesus asked Simon Peter Simon son of Jonah do you love me more than this he said to him yes Lord I you know that I love you he said to him feed my lambs he said to him again a second time Simon son of Jonah do you love me Peter answered yes Lord you know I love you then my sheep and one more time in verse 17 Simon do you love me and Peter this time was grieved and Jesus said no and and Jesus said to him a third time do you love me and he said Peter said you know all things Lord you know that I love you and Jesus said feed my sheep feed my sheep this is prophecy this is projecting and predicting Peter's ministry into the future attending to the sea to the sheep and feeding the sheep spiritually so it is the church where the sheep shall be fed so we must not chase the sheep away so that they can get spiritual food somewhere else if you want food you can only get the food by going to him and not from him if you want spiritual food you can only get from jesus by going to jesus and not going from jesus but i i know of a pastor who has told the sheep you want teaching you want to learn the bible go attend bible school go elsewhere but the same thing is not taught in the church and that is said we cannot chase the people away send them away so that they can get spiritual food elsewhere so anyway back to this event back to this event all i want to say before i move on to verse 16 is the disciples they underestimated jesus and they overestimated the problem they underestimated Jesus and they overestimated the problem. But let's move on, verse 16. But Jesus said to them, back to Mark 14, verse 16. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. You, are in my Bible, I underline you. If I were the disciples, among the disciples, I'll probably be looking at each other. We'll probably be looking at each other. What is he talking about? What do we have? You give them something to eat. Me? No, Lord Jesus, you got it wrong. If it is, it must come from you because we don't have. But Jesus said, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. What was Jesus doing? Jesus was inviting their participation. It was a lesson indeed for the disciples. It is not always that Jesus does everything and they just watch. And since they just came back from their, old, their, their ministry and they came back and reported to Jesus, Jesus would not want to stop them there, want them to continue to participate in his ministry. So he said, you give them something to eat. Verse 17. And they said to him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. So they acknowledge their lack. They acknowledge that they do not have. And I think it's a good lesson for us. First of all, we need to come before Jesus and acknowledge our lack. Because we cannot, but He can. In all situations when we are down and we are lacking, whether financial need, physical need, emotional need, 
This is what Jesus said to them in Mark chapter 10, verse 27. Just remembering this, it will help us even as we acknowledge our need, our lack. But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. They knew they cannot give the people something to eat. They do not have the means. But what they had was just five loaves and two fish. But what can they do with five loaves and two fish? But Jesus can. With God, all things are possible. And in case you want to know, um, where did these five loaves and two fish come from? We look at John chapter 6, verse 9, verse 5. John chapter 6, verse... Okay, verse 8. Look at verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to Jesus, There is a lad here, a small boy who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among us? So it came from a little boy. And such provisions are usually carried for short journeys. So probably the mummy packed for the boy his lunch and said, okay, while well, you're out today, uh, this is your lunch pack. Go, have it for yourself. I wonder... What about the others? There were thousands of people around. Did they not have their lunch pack with them? But the record shows there is only this boy with five barley loaves and two fish. Now, lest you think these are big, you know, French loaves. No, these are just small, small barley cakes. Of those days, the food of the poor... And these barley cakes are small in portion, which only the poor will eat. And we have fish, two fish. This is not your fried fish. This is not your steamed fish. This is pickle fish or dried fish. Just uh, to go with the barley cake. And that is indeed... A very small provision. I'm not even sure this staple food here is enough for the little boy. And we cannot even imagine if it will feed the rest. But that's what it was. We come before Jesus and said, Lord, here I am. I am empty. Fill me. These are my hands. Lord, before you, empty. Use me. So when we come before him empty, then he can fill us till it is overflowing even as he uses us. So these disciples acknowledge their lack. They told him the problem. And so we come to verse 18. He said, Bring them here to me. Bring them here to me. So, now you have a command from Jesus and he said, bring this bread and this, bring this bread and this uh, fish to him. And so the second thing we need to do, first we need to tell him our problems. Second thing is we need to listen. So they heard Jesus, bring them here to me. And of course, the third thing, obviously, is obey. So, then, in verse 19, then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. So, the people obeyed. Not just the disciples, but the people obeyed as well. Now, if we look uh, into Mark chapter 6, you will see this was quite orderly done. Mark chapter 6, verse 
same event, then he commanded them to make them. So he commanded the disciples to make the people. He commanded the disciples to make the people all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks, in hundreds and in fifties. And this tells me they were orderly. So in the house of God, in a gathering, in any church event, it must be orderly. Because here, Jesus commanded them to be orderly. Now, they were sitting on green grass. But later, later, when we look at um, Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15, verse 35. This is the event of the feeding of the 4,000. This is a separate miracle, different miracle. Earlier, the one that we are studying now is the feeding of the 5,000. This is the feeding of the 4,000. And in verse 35, and in verse 35, and in verse 35, he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks. So, in chapter 14, they were sitting on the green grass. And that tells me it is spring, springtime. And later, when we come to chapter 15, when it was feeding the 4,000 and they were sitting on the ground, that tells me it was summer. The grass is not so green, it is hot, and maybe less grass, so they were sitting on the ground. So, back to Matthew chapter 14, verse 19. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven... He blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples and the disciples gave to the multitudes. So, the disciples told them the problem. The disciples listened to his instruction and the disciples and the people obeyed and they sat down and Jesus took the loaves and the fish and looking up to heaven. He wasn't looking down. He was giving thanks to God for the provision, seeking God's blessing uh, for the food. And even in a Jewish tradition, uh, it is common, it is normal for them to thank God for the food. And this was what Jesus did. The one thing I noticed here is he wasn't looking down. He was looking up to heaven. And Jesus blessed it and he broke it and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. Well, why did Jesus not just give to the people himself? He could have just given it and, and bypassed the disciples so that the people get to know who is the one giving to them. Uh, the disciples can just stand to the side. No, the lesson here is because there are so many, thousands of them, and one person cannot physically do the work. So there need to be delegation and there need to be participation of the disciples. When Jesus left, when he ascended back to heaven after he was resurrected, the ministry of the propagation of the gospel to the whole world was not completed yet. But he left it having delegated to his disciples, the 12 of them. And they went to turn the world right side up. So this is getting the disciples involved. And we are disciples of Jesus Christ. We also need 
to be involved in the ministry of distributing food, the spiritual food, the Word of God. And so my question to you is, what are you willing to give? Are you willing to give to him what you have? For the little boy, that was all he had. Five loaves and two fish. And we ought to ask ourselves, what are we willing to give? And he will take whatever we have and he will break it and he will multiply it for the extension of his kingdom. Verse 20. So they all ate and were filled. And they all ate and were filled. Now, this is abundance. They all ate and were filled. Let me tell you, this is a very this was a very uncommon experience for them. I do not believe that every meal was a meal that they ate to the full. And on this occasion, sitting on the grass far away from home, they had nothing, they brought nothing with them, and yet they ate and they were filled. And not only that, they were so full that they could not eat everything that was given or available because there was remain there were lots of food remaining they took up 12 baskets they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remain now why not 10 why not 11 why not 13 why 12 this points prophetically and Jesus was pointing to them this points prophetically to the last days when the remnants, that's where we see the word here, fragment, where the remnants, those who remain standing for Christ, the Jews, because during the tribulation, the Jews will be going through a very rough time. Many of them will be persecuted. But even in this tribulation, in that tribulation, there will be Jews. There will still be people from the 12 tribes if you look at Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7, let's look at uh, verse 4. And here, the seal of Israel, those who are sealed for Jesus Christ from the tribe of, I mean, from the nation of Israel, and John, the apostle John, who wrote this for us. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And you know, God is not true with Israel yet. And if you read, all the 12 tribes are there. And these are the remnants. These are the people who remain because they have given and they have given their lives to Jesus Christ. So, but this is for another lesson, another day when we will come to this. Suffice to say, back to Matthew chapter 14, verse 20. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. So before we move on, we look at John chapter 6, verse 35. John chapter 6, verse 35. Let me read from verse 32. John chapter 6. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And who is he? Jump to verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. So you and I are to go forth participating in this ministry 
to distribute, distribute the food, the bread of life, that others will eat and never be hungry again, and neither will they thirst. So, oh, since we are here, we must all look at verse 12. Verse 12, chapter 6, verse 12. So when they ha- and when they were filled, so this is the same event about feeding that 5,000 recorded in uh, John. So when they were filled, he said to, the, to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. So nothing is to be wasted. But at the same time, if you look at this prophetically, gather up the remnants of Israel that remain, that no one is lost. So all that are Jesus, Jesus will save them. So that is uh, verse 20. Now we come to verse 21. Uh, So after telling Jesus their problem, uh, they listened to him and then they obeyed. Now they will rejoice. Of course, from a life of obedience, there will be rejoicing. So verse 21, Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. So they only numbered the men. So if you assume that every man has a wife, and they have at least a child, normally they have more than one, so if you multiply 5,000 by a factor of 3, because you include the wife and the kid, you would have 15,000. And that is a lot of people to feed from just 5 loaves and 2 fish. So now, after they had eaten, after those who had eaten, and these people, the multitudes, not all are Jews, some may be Gentiles, but they are just curious, they wanted the healing. So this is a picture of the world. So after, after the world has been fed the gospel, if we look at this prophetically, now those who had eaten were 5,000 men besides women and children. So after the world generally, overall, big number, they are, after they have been fed, then there were all this uh, remaining. There is enough room for everyone. So we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. This is that of Paul who complained of his thorn in the flesh and three times he asked Jesus to, to remove it. But Jesus said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So even in this occasion of the feeding of the 5,000, It was the grace of Jesus Christ. That means giving them what they do not deserve. They have done nothing to earn the dinner, but His grace is sufficient for them. In fact, it was more than sufficient. They said there there were left 12 baskets full of the fragments. So, before we leave this, um, there are Three things I, I, I want to just sort of have it regist- have them registered in us before we leave this miracle. Number one is he is concerned about our physical needs. Jesus is concerned about our physical needs. If you look at Romans chapter 8, verse 32, He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him with Jesus, God with Jesus, also freely give us all things. So, 
Point is, he is concerned about our physical needs. Secondly, he will use small things to do great things. He will use the five loaves and two fish and he will multiply them. So whatever you have in your hand, offer it to Jesus. Whatever time, talent and treasure you have, offer it unto Jesus and he will do great things. Thirdly, his provisions can go a long, long way. As we saw, he fed the 5,000 or 15,000 at least, and then still there were remains of the, of the food, the fragments, 12 baskets full of the fragments. It can go a long, long way. So if we look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. He can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. And that is the God whom we worship. So we will pause here. And when we return, we'll resume with verse 22.